Good morning. So for those of you who are, y'all hear me? Is my microphone on? Is it on? Okay, I don't know. I can't tell. Uh, yeah, hey. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, just know that I'm Ray Crompton. I'm the shepherding pastor. I'm not the normal guy. Uh, so don't, and don't leave. Don't follow everybody else who knows me. Oh, but. But don't worry, uh, I have about, a, about an hour and a half of a terrific sermon for you that you're going you're gonna to love it. It's going to be, you're going to enjoy every second. Just kidding. About the hour and a half part. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you meet us right where we are, that you want to speak to us. Lord, that you know where we're coming from and you know where we're going to. And uh, you want to give us the words, Lord, that, was, that will uh, draw us closer to you. And I pray, Father, that we would have ears to hear, Lord, and that we would be willing to be molded and shaped by you, Father, transformed by you, Lord, that we can live like your sons and daughters. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. So um, as a pastor, one of the things that you know, we pick different things that we like to do about our jobs, the things we love the most. And the thing I love the most is my one-on-one -on -one meetings. I love doing that. Uh, it's interesting. On the personality test, I test an extrovert, but I live like an introvert. I love being alone, but I also love being one-on-one -on -one with people, connecting, hearing what's going on, uh, pursuing the heart of people who go to this church. And that's always been true since I've been in ministry. I used to be a campus minister at Elon University for 20 years, and uh, it was the same thing there, too. And sometimes you know what a meeting is going to be like, and sometimes you don't. And usually I do. Usually I know when somebody says, hey, Ray, I'd like to get together and uh, have some time with you. I usually know if it's going to be a positive thing, if it's going to be, like, exciting, like, yeah, God is teaching me this and this and this, or if uh, there's some hard things going on, or if they have, like, a question about something that, they should, whether they should or shouldn't do it, and looking for some wisdom as if I had that to offer. But um, this one particular meeting, and this happens sometimes, a lady who used to go to church here, she, she called me and she wanted to get together. She gave me no clue as to what the meeting was about. And so what I do anyway, but I do it a lot harder when I don't know, and that is I pray. I pray before the meeting. God, please let me know before she gets here what this is going to be about. Or at least give me a sense of what I can say to her and how I can encourage her or whatever. And so here's what happens. She comes in, and the first thing that she does when she sits down on the sofa is she says, I'm probably going to cry a lot. And so I pull the box of Kleenex and give it to her. There it is. It's yours. And as soon as she starts to speak, she begins to weep. And you might be able to relate to some of the things that she said. She said, I've been a Christian since my early 20s. I've been following God all that time. And I know the basics of the faith, and I know about God, and I know what he says about me, and that kind of thing. And then she started sharing about her pain. And some of the pain in her life has been really immense. And uh, she's had a lot of problems pop up. Once in a while, she has a good year or so. She talks about her struggle with believing, believing that she's really a daughter of Christ, really believing that God loves her. Like, how could he? She talks about the struggle of her sin. And I know I'm forgiven, but I keep doing the same thing. Or it haunts me. The guilt of that. And so then she says, as a follower of Christ, if he is who he says he is, and if I am who he says I am, then why all the fear? Why all the pain? Why all the struggle? Why all the moments of disbelief? Why all the haunting of sin? Why? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tracking right with her. I get it. I'm not saying that I felt the same pain she did and that mine was worse or better or anything like that, like that although uh, her stories were pretty intense. And I'm going to tell you that as a pastor, I'm not going to pretend to always have the answers. I've said, I don't know lots of times. You know, some pastors won't do that. Some pastors won't say, I don't know. But I will. So if I ever say I don't know to you, don't feel alone. Because sometimes I don't know. But I'm really glad that I prayed before she got there. Because I really believe that God gave me the right words to say to her. Let me tell you what I didn't say. I didn't say, it'll be all right. Didn't say that. And I didn't say, well, maybe you should pray more. Have you tried praying on your knees instead of just sitting around praying? And I didn't say, well, you know what? There's probably some sin in your life that you're just clinging to. I didn't say any of that. A, those would have been inappropriate. And B, they'd have been wrong. So here's what I said. I said, we live in a world that we weren't created for. And that's just the way it is. No, I didn't stop there. Because that sounds kind of hopeless, doesn't it? But we live in a vapor. This world that we live in, it's hard to have, rea- it's hard to have con- you know, percept- percept- real perspective in this. But we live, this is what we know, this, this world, it's, it's like a vapor, and it, and it comes and goes. But we were created to live in a world where we take long walks with our Heavenly Father in the garden. We were created to be face-to-face with our God. We were created for a world of perfection and painlessness, a world where nothing interrupted our relationship with Jesus. That's what we were created for. But as we all know, this world, the one we live in right now, just doesn't feel right. Because it's not the world we were created for. Brandon Manning wrote in a quote this. Now, Brandon Manning is a writer. He's one of my favorite writers. There is real hope in the basic truth. This is not our home. There is more than this. And that's good to know. That's good to know. Now, Paul wrote a letter to some Jewish, Jewish Romans. And these Jewish Romans, man, they lived a hard life. Because this letter written to these folks, this isn't that long after Jesus had been resurrected, died and resurrected. And they were uh, believers in him. But they lived in a world where, first of all, they were a huge minority. Because most people didn't believe in God. And believe in Christ. They, they, they believed that Messiah hadn't come yet. And they lived in a government that really looked down on them, a government that didn't like their culture, a government that uh, didn't like the things that they believed. The Roman government would look at them and go, you believe in one God? That's ridiculous. There's lots of gods. Why not believe in those? Romans looked at them as atheists because they didn't believe in lots of gods. Just one. They, just lived, they just believed in one. And they were in captivity. They, were, they really were. They were in captivity. In many ways, they were servants to a government they didn't agree with. I imagine they felt hopeless. I imagine that they felt a lot of fear day to day. They don't know what's going to happen. What if this persecution turns into somebody killing me? They were bound by what they, by what they could not control. I imagine there were lots of tears when they were together, or even when they were alone. 
and people asking why. I gave my life to this. Why do I feel so bound? Why do I feel, why isn't there freedom here? Why all these problems, why all these issues? They were likely felt bound by their circumstance. But here's what we need to hold on to. Here's what these folks need to hold on to, and that is this. No matter the circumstance or how we feel, we are free in Christ. Romans 8, 1 and 2 say, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free, free from the law of sin and death. So there is no longer, although you might feel it, there's no longer, the truth is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I'm going to say in Christ a lot to this sermon, so get used to that. Those of us who are in Christ, there's no condemnation. Satan wants you not to feel that. He doesn't want you to feel hope. He doesn't want you to feel freedom. He doesn't want you to feel that you were, that you were created for the things you were created for. He wants you to feel, cre- feel like you were created to be condemned. He wants you to be bound. And we, and we feel condemned. We feel bound because Satan uses past guilt and present failures and present circumstances and present fears to make us question Christ and what he has done for us. Is that not true? In our darkest moments. But our assurance must be focused on Christ and not our circumstance. But here's what happens. Our own conscience reminds us of guilt, of sins. People will point out how we're not a good enough Jesus follower. Anybody ever done that to you? Yeah. Me too. Past memories will haunt us. Listen, those, the things that have happened to you are real. And they will haunt you. Void of Christ. Personal dysfunctions like shame and low self-esteem will trip us up. The perfection of the law, if we look at the law, will show us how imperfect we are. Sometimes I think we can even allow Christ and how he lived, his perfection, and go, I'll never add up to that. As if we're supposed to. And what's worse is sometimes we compare ourselves to other Christians and we go, I'm inadequate. You don't know that. You don't know what other Christians do. Look at each other. I'm just kidding. (laughs) What can ultimately happen in those times is we become overwhelmed by that captivity of our circumstance. It leads to hopelessness. Rather than turning our minds in Christ to the the reality of Christ, who is with us in our circumstance and offers us freedom today. Not when this life is over, but today. So what do we do? Well, in the midst of a world that would cause us to feel limited and conflicted, we can receive perspective in Christ. Listen to this reality. Listen to this truth in Romans 9 through 11. And let this kind of sink in. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. It doesn't say maybe you might be in the realm of the flesh today, but later you'll be in the realm of the Spirit. No, it does not say that. It speaks of what's true. You, however, are not in the realm of flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not fall, have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, if you have a relationship with Him, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life. Not is going to give life, it gives life. 
because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who um, excuse me, living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. You see, sometimes we just need perspective to stop and receive perspective. Pastor Bud, our lead pastor, said a couple of weeks ago that, um, <clears throat> that heaven is more real. Eternity in heaven is more real than what we experience today. Now, I know that's hard to grasp, but that's true. That's true. You're going to find out. But that's true. So if that's true, then wouldn't it be true that the spiritual perspective is more real than the fleshly perspective. Don't those things align? Doesn't that make sense? So, so whatever is around us, what is happening in our lives is ever fleeting. I struggle with this because my, uh, my go-to is living in the flesh. Well, wait a minute, you're a pastor. Stop that. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. I didn't know what to do with my life after college. Didn't know what to do. But here's what I wanted. Doggone it, I wanted to make a lot of Money. Money. Because I grew up poor, and I wanted money. I liked it. I got offered an opportunity to move to Kansas City and to um, work at Hallmark, be a rep for Hallmark. Pay was good. I was single, young. Kansas City, that'd be exciting. It's a whole lot more exciting than Burlington. Um, <laughs> I mean, nothing personal to you, brilliant. <laughs> I'm from Charlotte, so I, I like a, big, a little bit bigger town. So um, that's the answer. Of course, God's got my back. He wants me to be a rep of Hallmark. That makes all the sense in the world. Be able to support a family and drive a nice car. But then people kept saying, you know, you should think about being a pastor. Mm -mm. I want to do that. You know, you'd be a great campus minister with college students. I was doing some volunteer stuff at UNCG, and I'm like, mm -mm. oh, no. Because, see, y'all might, might not know this, but um, being a pastor, uh, well, let's just say you're not going to get rich, okay, monetarily. See, the other thing made more sense but I had no perspective. I thought rich life meant be rich, but rich life meant doing what God would call me to do, and that was be a pastor of college students, and then a pastor to you. That was living in the spiritual. Not that everybody has to be a pastor. That's crazy. <laughs> Believe me. If you are in Christ, according to this passage, you're not subject to death, but that of life. In Christ, there is life, and in everything else, there's death. There's no in-between. There's no middle. Christ, the spiritual, life in Him, other, other side, death. There's nothing in between. What do you want to be? It says that the, the Spirit that freed Jesus from death. Now imagine that. The spirit that freed Jesus from death, the one that caused him, you know, he, drew, he, went, he went to the cross for all of us, all of our stuff, and he, was, he, and, and, and he defeated it, defeated it. The spirit that defeated that death is the same spirit that lives here in you. Let that sink in just for a second. It's the same thing. It's the same one. So our response is to live differently. 
to live differently in Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation that it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit... You put, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. So we have an obligation. Our obligation is to respond. Our obligation is to be in relationship with Christ. Our, our, our response and our obligation is to, is to allow Jesus to um, connect with us, for us to walk with him and to live in life, but we're bent toward the flesh now because we, because we, again, it's a process, and the flesh we think at times offers us life, but it doesn't. And here's another reality: see, God speaks our language; He wants us to understand this, and so He said, "So, so uh, we have been adopted as sons and daughters in Christ." Now we know what it means to be a son and daughter. For some of us, being a son or a daughter is a positive, great thing. And for other of us, being a son or a daughter is a painful thing. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received the Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his sufferings. So imagine feeling uh, like you're one of these Roman Jews who are captive and you're persecuted. In this context, Jewish folks would already consider themselves sons of God. But it now has a new meaning, and I like this new meaning. It does not mean that it's something that you were born into. Now you get to claim as a birthright that you are a child of God. It's a compelling move by God that you are in relationship with him, that he calls you sons and daughters. Because of Christ's death, access to God has changed. You don't have to go kill an animal, burn a sacrifice, stay out of the main room of the temple. You can go to God anytime you want to. Yeah, full access. He's waiting. Come on. Come on. Listen, I'm not near the Father that I want to be. And I'm certainly not near the Father that our Heavenly Father is. But man, my kids can ju come jump on my lap anytime they want to. Anytime. 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 They won't do it because they're teenagers. But they could. They always have access. Always. Now, they'll tell you when I'm grumpy they don't have access. <laughs> but they always do. But God doesn't get grumpy. And God doesn't get moody because he's a perfect father. So if your dad wasn't great or if your mom wasn't great, don't compare because there's no comparison. Father, by God's design, is perfect and all-loving and all-accepting and all-embracing. I mean, these folks, these, these Roman folks, they, they, feel cap they keep feel like servants, but they're not. From a, from a spiritual aspect, they are adopted children of God. Galatians 4, 5, and 6 says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, 
God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. And Abba, Father means daddy. Daddy. You hear that intimacy? You hear that intimacy? You hear that? That's the relationship we get to have with God. Maybe you don't have that relationship. Maybe you didn't know you could, but you can. Paul speaks in verse 15 about no longer being a slave to fear. A fear of what? Well, a fear of life under the law and constant fear of failure and obedience. Absence of fear is important in the Spirit's presence because fear and hope cannot exist in the same space. They can't. Think about what would affect an orphan or things that affect an, or- an orphan. They don't know day to day what's going to happen. The ones that are old enough to think that way, they, they're alone. Will anybody ever love them enough to take them home? But we have our daddy. We do. No matter what, no matter what you believe today, our Heavenly Father longs for intimacy. And as his sons and daughters, we have full access and our full heirs in Christ. Full heirs in Christ. We get it all. How do I know that? Well, because it says so. Verse 16. For a spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are heirs. In, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. How important is it for us to understand our status as God's children? Like I said, we have access to the Father. What's His is ours. Because He's really good at that. I'm really not. You know, my kids think that everything that's in the house is theirs. And they didn't buy hardly any of it. They just showed up. And they think they can have whatever they want. One morning I'm getting dressed, getting ready for it. And every time I get dressed and go to work, I always put on my shoes. In fact, it was these shoes. I couldn't find them. Like, where are my shoes? I looked all over the room. I went down to the garage. Where are my shoes at? They're my shoes. They have my footprint in them, you know, because I wear them every day just about. They're mine. Where are they? You know where they were? They were on my son Sam's feet. That's where they were. <laughs> now, what made him think that he could come to my room under my bed, pull out my shoes, and put them on his feet and leave the house and not tell me? Because he knows that I love him, and if he wants to wear my shoes, he can wear my shoes. There's a sense of belonging when we are in Christ. You see, my kids aren't being disrespectful. They just think this belongs to me. I'm part of the family. It's an invitation to belong. We had a uh, Chinese exchange student for three years while she was in high school, didn't live the 12th grade. And at first, she didn't, take, she didn't take our stuff. You see? At first, she asked if she could have this out of the other. By her senior year, she belonged. What was ours was hers. 
And she wasn't even our flesh and bone, right? She was just. The spirit within changes our obedience to God from, from slavery, servant relationship, where God is both master. Now, he's still our master. Let's not lose that. He's still our Lord and master. Okay? Y'all, y'all, y'all have that? Can you put your arms around that one and hold it just for a second? But he's also our loving father. And what's his is ours. So what does it mean to be heirs of God's glory? Well, I'll try to give an example of that. When I was, um, I used to, I'm from, I told you I'm from Charlotte. My, my uh, grandmother lived in Charlotte and all of our family lived there. And so I used to go to her house a lot. And even when I was a little guy, even a little guy, even up until I was in my 20s, I loved these oil lamps that she had. They were these big oil lamps. They were really cool. And I think they'd be worth a lot of money now. And, um, and so I loved them, and I loved to light them. And I loved to turn off all the lights and just light these oil lamps. I don't know why I was so drawn to them, but I really, really was, always, even when I got older. I would come in, and I would light them, and I would sit down, and I'd just reflect on whatever that you do when you are 18 or 19 years old. And uh, I wanted these, I wanted them. I wanted them in my house. My grandmother would watch me light them, and she took pleasure in the fact that I loved these lamps. And she said, you know what? When I die, I want you to have all these lamps. I'm like, oh, cool. And she told my grandfather, Bill, if I die first, Make sure Ray gets these oil lamps. And so um, she died. And shortly after that, my grandfather had a stroke. And this woman started taking care of him. And she ended up moving him over to her house. And I went over to my grandmother's house because I figured it was time to square the deal. And I couldn't find the oil lamps. It's like 25 of them. I couldn't find one oil lamp. So I went to my grandfather's house, well, this lady's house where my grandfather was living, and I said, Papa, where are the oil lamps? Well, he had a stroke. So he couldn't remember. And all he could say was, I don't know where they are. He couldn't really have a deep conversation with me. And so I asked Sue, the woman who my grandfather was living with, if she'd seen them. And she said, no, I have no idea where they are. She was lying. Now, let's just be real. She was lying. But what can I do? I snuck around her house a little bit to see if I could find them. And she caught me. I wanted them. I was furious. I got in my 1971 Cutlass Supreme. That thing is fast. And I floored it out of there. I was driving so fast. I was so angry. And about seven or eight miles down the road, it struck, to, it struck me. I do want the lamps. And, now I'm not, and I'm not going to get the lamps. But the important thing is, is that my grandmother wanted me to have them. You see? And nothing changed that. She longed for me to have those lamps because she knew that I loved them, that I enjoyed them. So a longing for her was that her grandson would have the lamps. Me not getting them doesn't change anything in terms of her longing. And that meant more than anything. I was on her heart. You are on the heart of the Father. Let that sink in. He loves you. What's his is yours. 
Because he wants you to have it. Because he loves you so much. Doesn't that do something to your soul? Nobody around you, as much as they love you, don't, doesn't love, they don't love you the way he does. Ultimately, this confliction between spirit and flesh will no longer be. It's not always going to be true. We will enjoy full inheritance because one day we will be in heaven. And I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know it's not going to be conflicted. We'll be in full relationship with our Heavenly Father. Full inheritance. Romans 8, 22 and 23 says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believe, we, we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us full rights as adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. It's not always going to be like this. Ultimately, this confliction of the spirit and the flesh will no longer be. We'll enjoy full inheritance. And God knows our struggle in the meantime. He gets it. He doesn't, he's not blind to it. He understands that we don't understand the fear. We don't understand the flesh, the pull to the flesh. He, un, he gets it that we struggle with pain and suffering. He gets it, and he's right there with us, and he's there to comfort us. He's there to give us perspective. He's there to hold us close. Do you believe that? But so often we live like we don't. He's not the first place we go. God knows our struggle, and he, he, Paul describes it as um, uh, having a kid, <laughs> you know, labor pains, birth pains. Now, guys, you don't know what that feels like. Don't pretend like you do because you will get smacked. I'm telling you, you will. Or don't say it out loud. But he's using the most awful pain he can think of in terms of real pain. I mean, there's, you know, the baby comes and it's glorious, but usually, but <laughs> it doesn't stay glorious, but it is in that moment. He gets it. But in the meantime, this is true. We, these orphans, are now adopted in relationship, not in heaven, but now, now, today, today. Think about that. If anybody understands, this is, this is from Max Lucado. If anybody understands God's ardor for his children, it's someone who has re rescued an orphan from despair. For that is what God has done for us. God has adopted you. God sought you, found you, signed the papers, and took you home. Now, today, you get that relationship. I'm going to close with a story. I told you I was a campus minister. My first year at Elon, I had a student. Four foot 11, tiny little thing. And she was the meanest kid I'd ever had. I'm telling you, she was mean. I mean, how do you pack so much meanness in four foot 11? But she was. And I can tell you story after story about how mean she was. But she was mean. Believe me. She would just say the most vicious things about her friends in their presence. And I'm like, what? She's having an argument with one kid in my office. This, this woman, this young lady named Sharon, and Sharon runs out crying after all this. I looked, at, I looked at Heather and I said, what is wrong with you? Really, what's wrong with you? That's not really what a pastor is supposed to say, but I couldn't <laughs> help it. About three months later, she attempted suicide. And um, it was awful. I was up all night with her and, or, with, or in, the, in the hospital. 
met her parents, spent a lot of time with them. I found out why she's so mean. They were awful. So she survived, and then she got to go back to school. And I, had, I spent an hour with her every week, every week after that. And what, we did, what I was doing in, in Scripture, I was like, you are not who your parents say you are. You are who, you're who your heavenly Father says you are. Let's look at this. Let's look at who he calls you, his beloved one. That's who you are. You're a daughter of Christ. That's who you are. He's giving you gifts. He adores you because you're adorable. She changed so much over those last two years, and she became a missionary. She went to India and Africa. She came back from India, and she showed me pictures. I couldn't believe it. And I was crying over it, like, oh, look what God has done in Heather. Look how he's changed her. So after lunch, I was taking her back to where she was staying, and she goes, I have a letter for you, and you can read it later, but don't read it right now. She goes, but I do want to tell you one thing. She said, I want, you to, I want to thank you for not giving up on me. And I want to thank you for sticking with me even though I pushed you away. And thank you for showing me who I am in the eyes of my Heavenly Father because that changed everything. It changes everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, for everything that you are, that you are a Heavenly Father. And that you offer us life, even in the midst of this stuff that we call the flesh. And that we are your sons and daughters. That we get to um, inherit, inherit you and your stuff, your things, your life. Father, um, we pray, Lord, that we know that. We pray that, Father, pray for my friends here, Lord, that... Um, that they would know they're the beloved sons and daughters of, of Christ, and that'd be the most important thing to them. God, for those here who don't know you and didn't know that you were such a loving father that offered a real relationship, I pray that they today would give their life to you, Father. I pray that they would set down all the stuff that they've been leaning on, and they would come to you, Father, and ask you to live in them. And those of us who have followed you for a while and who are uh, believers, Lord, we pray that we uh, believe deeper, that we would see you, Lord, as our Heavenly Father who we have access to all the time, anytime. And even in our deepest, darkest days, Lord God, that we can come to you and you receive us. Father, I pray that would be what our life looks like, us coming to Dad and crying, Abba, Father, when you receive us. Pray that that would be our reality over everything else. And it's your son's name that we pray. Amen.